Okay, I think that we're live. Um, a warm hello to all of you who've joined us from your homes. Uh, I'm so happy to see that there are really a lot of you and more coming in every second. Uh, I'm Dorothea von Moltke. I'm one of the owners of Labyrinth Books. And I wanna start by thanking our guests, Nicole Fleetwood and Ruha Benjamin. Um, they agreed to switch from what had been planned as uh, an in-store event um, to this online event now. And we're presenting this event as we would have the other in close partnership with our good friends at the Princeton Public Library. So shout out to them. Um, a few practical things maybe quickly. I want to be sure that you know that you can get a copy of Nicole Fleetwood's book, which we are discussing. Here it is, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Beautiful, amazing book. Um, and you can get that from Labyrinth. There it is. At a 10% discount, uh, it'll ship free, or you can uh, pick it up curbside if you order it over the phones. Uh, and Nicole has also uh, agreed to sign some book plates and those will be coming to us so you can actually get a signed copy from us. And our phone number and our um, phone hours, all of that will be in the chat feed, but you can also find it on our homepage at labyrinthbooks.com. So our plan for this next hour is for me to introduce our speakers briefly. Then Nicole will talk about her book and show us some images for 10 or 15 minutes. And after that, Ruha will join her for a conversation. And then we will leave time for your questions at the end. So I want to make sure that you know how best to ask questions on this particular platform. Um, and this is how, please go to the ask a question button that you should see in the sort of middle bottom of your screen. Uh, instead of putting questions in the chat feed, we'll, we'll take from the ask a question uh, box. And feel free to just put your questions in the queue as you think of them uh, as the conversation goes. And then if you see a question already in the queue that interests you as well, uh, you can upvote that by clicking, there's a little arrow. You can click on that arrow and then we can see that there's a sort of cumulative interest in a particular question and uh, be sure to get to those. But now um, we are here to talk about Nicole's remarkable new book, uh, Marking Time. We know, I think, that in the time of this pandemic, um, I think the figure, Nicole, in your book is almost 2.3 million incarcerated men and women in America. They are in grave danger and are suffering and dying from the pandemic um, out of sight to a terrifying degree. I read in the Associated Press a report that 70% of prisoners who are tested in federal prisons uh, tested positive for COVID-19. So it feels extra important to have this hour to talk about the ways in which art by prison inmates helps us see, um, helps us see the injustice and the dehumanizing conditions of the carceral state but I think also helps us see the um, extraordinary creative strength of so many behind bars. They're fashioning and expressing a self. Um, they are fashioning a critique and a counter vision. And we'll hear, I think, that all of this for Nicole, um, all these realities are very personal. She is a writer, a curator, curator an art critic, and professor of uh, American studies and art history at Rutgers University. Her books before Marking Time are on racial icons, blackness and the public imagination, and troubling vision, performance, visuality, and blackness. And with us to talk with Nicole about Marking Time is lucky us, Benjamin Ruha. Ruha Benjamin, I'm sorry, Ruha. Ruha. One of the most eloquent thinkers, I think, that we have on the relationship between uh, knowledge and power, race and citizenship, and also health and justice. Ruha is professor at Princeton University uh, in the African American Studies Department. She uh, founded the Just Data Lab, which you should check out. Um, it aims to rethink and retool data uh, for justice, towards bending it for, towards justice. And Rua's two books are People Science, Bodies and Rights on the Stem Cell Frontier, and uh, Race After Technology, last year's book, Race After Technology. 
So with that, Nicole, um, I will take myself and Rua quite literally out of the picture uh, for a bit. So you can tell us a bit more about the origins maybe and the conception of your book. And then so uh, show us also some of the images that are so amazingly reproduced in this book. And then uh, I will bring Ruha back up and you guys can take it from there. Does that sound good? Sounds great. All right, so here we go. Let me toggle for just one second uh, to, get, to get me out of the view. And while you're still here, I want to thank you for organizing it, Dorothy. And, and thanks to your team at um, Labyrinth Books. Uh, thank you for everyone who's checking in. It's great to see all the names and places. Yeah, keep, keep letting us know who you are. Let's, let's create this, make this digital community as warm um, and as dynamic as possible. I want to say I'm so excited to be in conversation with Ruha. I am like a huge fan. Ruha and I were together almost this exactly this time last year at an event um, at University of Delaware organized by some of our friends, Tanisha Ford and Brandy Summers Thompson with a, a group of amazing black feminists. So, and we were talking about both of our projects that are out now. So it's great to like um, have this moment with you um, to talk about to talk about the book. I also want to thank Harvard University Press. Um, my publicist, Sonia, and my editor, Andrew, um, who I think are here, and for just like the really beautiful job that Harvard did on actually producing the book and, and just and the care that they put into it. It's been really fantastic um, working with, with people there. And so um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is talk for about 10 to 15 minutes about the book. Um, and you won't see me as I talk about the book. I'm going to share um, a PowerPoint. Um, and go through some images that are in the book and just tell you a bit about how the project was conceived and um, some of the discoveries or things I learned through the process. So I wanna start by showing you the cover of the book. Um, the cover of the book is really meaningful for me. It is by an artist. Nicole, your your PowerPoint isn't shared yet, I don't think. So uh, it's saying that it's, it said Crowdcast is sharing a window. Um, and I can try it again. Yeah. Now, we now, we're, now we're good. That's are perfect. you able to see it? Okay, I'll go back from the. I'll I'll start at the beginning. Can you see the cover, Dorothy? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Um, so the cover is by an artist, Mark Lofney, who's currently. Um, in prison in the state of Pennsylvania and has been checking in through his mom, Donna, who's a wonderful ally, um, both about his, the state of things under COVID um, in Pennsylvania and just also his cheering on the project from incarceration. We were able through Art for Justice Fund get um, a special edition paperback printed and the books were sent um, in prisons back in mid-March, so before they before the hardback was released to a public. Um, and so I'm very um, honored and for me it's really significant to have my first readers to be people who are directly impacted and who are my primary readers. I wrote this book for the people who appear in the book. And Mark Lafney's Pyrrhic Defeat, I, I think, is a really um, in, important example of what I attempt to develop in the book, which is um, a way of thinking about art made, art and visual culture in the era of mass incarceration. So I'm thinking about art made inside US prisons, but I'm also thinking about the broader visual culture of mass incarceration and also non-incarcerated artists who are socially engaged and who are doing what, who, who are using their practices and their aesthetic experiments to, to really expose aspects of the carceral state. Mark is doing that work from the site of captivity where he, he's um, been in prison in um, Pennsylvania for many years. And over the course of his time there, he has amassed this series called Pyrrhic Defeat, a visual study of mass incarceration. And for the series, he asked other incarcerated people to sit for 20 minutes while he does these elaborate graphite sketches. For him, it's also really important to see the series as one ongoing work. So far, he has about 500 of them. Um, because for him, it's not about um, it's it's not about uh, the work standing as individual isolated portraits, but uh, but a collectivity of people who are held 
in punitive captivity. And the project for me, and I think one reason that that um, cover, Mark Laffany's work on the cover is so important for me. Um, it's because I started working on this book um, by reflecting on the toll that prisons have taken on my family um, and the community I grew up in Southwest Ohio. And I have to say that when I first started this project, I, I, I didn't know it would be a book. I just, when people invited me to share starting like maybe 2011, um, instead of talking about a book that I'd already finished, I started showing a series of photographs of my incarcerated relatives during visits and during trips back to Ohio. Um, I would take annual trips back to visit incarcerated relatives. Um, and as I started to think of this as possibly a, a project that I would make public, not necessarily a project that I was thinking as an academic project, but something that for me encompass the political, personal, and scholarly, and also spiritual aspects of my life. I struggled to figure out like how to visualize the toll of incarceration, to make it personal about my family, but also to make sure that that was connected to the many millions of family members who are grieving um, how carcerality has restructured their family and have isolated them from loved ones. Um, so through sharing, through, through public presentations, a, an incredible community of formerly incarcerated artists, allies, activists, educators, lawyers formed around, partly around the work, but they were already doing this work and it just, my, my community grew. And so people would tell me about other artists, um, would tell me about organizations that were doing work in prison. And out of that, the project grew and it, it, it turned out to be this 350 page book that uh, encompasses seven chapters where you have different case studies from thinking about um, the actual conditions under which incarcerated people make art. This um, um, painting by Ronnie Gutman, who's now who's a formerly incarcerated artist in San Francisco is really for me um, a, a striking example of the conditions under which many make art when they, especially in prisons that are more resourced, he's in San Quentin um, making art in a workshop space run by the William James Association, which has a very long history since 1977 of uh, doing art programs in prisons throughout the state of California. And Ronnie for is also, this, this painting is also important for Ronnie because it's a self portrait in which he's painting himself in a tradition of artists Re artists rendering themselves at work. So it's about the, the conditions of carcerality and it's also about a tradition of art making that he is painting himself into. When I interviewed Ra Ronnie, and the book is centers around about 70 interviews that I've done with currently and formerly incarcerated artists, he like opened up this painting for me in a way that a close academic reading alone would not allow for me to enter. And part of what he told me he was doing was curating around himself. So he said the artwork in, in this painting was not necessarily hung in that space in that kind of way, but he was bringing works that he valued closer to himself. So he's doing these acts of discernment um, in the process of also rendering himself as an artist at work. Um, Tamika Cole is another artist who appears in the book um, and helped me to think about the kind of time, the way that incarcerated people use time as punishment um, uh, to, to make works of art that both talk about their captivity, but also um, exceed the punishment mandates of the state. And so Tamika Cole made Locked in a Dark Calm when she was um, in prison in Alabama and she was experiencing abuse by prison staff. And she said anything she did would do to um, resist that abuse would just lengthen her sentence or make her sentence, sentence more severe. So she turned to art and this is a collage and graphite piece called Locked in a Dark Calm in which she said she was creating the kind of space of calm and the, the space of her own um, kind of vision of freedom um, while also protecting herself psychically from the harm that she was experiencing. Many of the artists I interviewed and who appear in the book um, are thinking about racial capitalism. They're thinking about 
um, the business of punishment. They are thinking about the idea of, of, of the idea and the kind of materiality of warehousing people and the long continuation of black captivity and black subject uh, subjugation. James Hoff, who goes by the artist name Ayaya, is one example of that. And um, this is a watercolor he um, did in 2018 when he was um, in serving a life without parole sentence in Pennsylvania. He was sentenced to life without parole as a juvenile at age 17. Um, and after 27 years in prison, he was released when, because that um, sentence has been ruled unconstitutional. His work speaks to Mary Baxter and Mary Baxter and he are um, part of an artist community that has formed um, in Philadelphia and some other areas where you have um, high numbers of returning citizens, people who've been um, incarcerated and many of them experience long-term incarceration and they're forming these communities. Um, and they're also doing a lot of activism um, from uh, the leadership of people who are directly impacted, Mary Baxter being one of those people. Um, she created a triptych video called Ain't I a Woman? Um, and it's about her 43 hour ordeal of being in labor while she was in prison. Um, and during that time she was shackled. Um, she underwent an emergency C-section and after giving, delivering her son, she was then put in solitary confinement. So she, um, in Ain't I a Woman, she's connecting her struggle uh, to a long history of, of, of black women, um, forced reproduction, captivity, but also black feminist abolition um, as not only a theory, but an actual praxis for liberating not just herself, but liberating communities. Jared Owens is another artist who's thinking about this long captivity um, of, of, of uh, making connections, carso, thinking about the carceral continuum um, in his painting, Elapsium. Um, and Elapsium is a painting that he, he made actually once he was released from 18 years in federal prison. Um, he was on parole, but one of the things that Jared did is bring prison soil home with him in jars, and he now uses that soil. He mixes it into his painting paints, um, and it's an example of what I call penal matter, and that's the use of materials from prisons or from the carceral state um, as elements um, of artistic experimentation. And you see that take place in the work of a lot of incarcerated artists, uh, such as Jesse Crimes, who made this series of mugshot portraits using newspapers um, um, and prison records and legal journals to transfer images of, um, of incarcerated people or people who are suspected of, of a crime onto prison bars of soap. And this um, series is called Purgatory. Jared and Jesse were incarcerated together in the state uh, in New Jersey at, at a federal prison, and they created a multiracial art collective with another artist, Gilberto Rivera. And here's a work by Gilberto Rivera that again uses what I call penal matter, and that's his prison uniform. Gilberto um, was someone who was highly surveilled while he was in prison because he was labeled a gang member, and so much of his art was actually confiscated. Um, as uh, signifying um, um, gang activity, no matter what the artwork was. And so this was his response to that like high level of punitive surveillance was to create this piece using his prison uniform called an institutional nightmare. I'm gonna show you a few other examples of works from the book and talk about some of the chapters around it. I spent, um, I didn't realize when I started to work on this book that I would write an entire chapter on portraiture but only through interviews did it come up that portraiture is such um, an important genre in prisons. It's, it's probably the most popular genre in prisons. Um, and largely because it is, uh, most incarcerated people don't have access to photographic technology. So they often draw or paint portraits of loved ones. Um, there's a huge um, business around commissioning portrait work. So if you're a great portrait artist in prison, you're what people often call prison rich, you're in high demand, people will barter with you for coffee or for other services um, in exchange for 
for portrait work. Um, George Anthony Morton, this is uh, one of his portraits called Mars. He, in his 10 years in prison, became an accomplished portrait artist. And once he was released, he was admitted to the Florence Academy where this um, portrait, Mar Mars, um, was chosen as the 2016 portrait of the year. Um, many incarcerated artists also use um, portraiture as a way of resisting criminal indexes. And by criminal indexes, I mean mug shots, prison ID photos, sen sentencing documents. Um, and Russell Craig is a really great example of, of the use of penal matter um, to create self-portrait work and to create self-portraits that resist um, a, a kind of carceral biography. And so Russell um, created this 10 foot by eight foot self-portrait based off of all of his criminal records um, that he amassed over from foster care at age five to being released from prison in his early to mid thirties um, and made what a ma this masterwork called self-portrait. Self I have, I think, two more works to show you, and then I'm going to, then Ruha will join me in conversation. Um, I have a chapter um, that I'll talk to you more about in a few minutes on um, solitary confinement. And when I started to work on this book, I did not realize that I would be making a book on um, solitary confinement. Um, but what happened, or I'm sorry, writing a chapter on solitary confinement, but what happened is that over the um, course of revising the book, I noticed that so many of the artists I had interviewed had talked about doing time in solitary confinement. So at one point I just took all those examples and put them together in one chapter and realized one, the horror of this kind of shared experience and how common solitary confinement um, is and, and used in U.S. prisons and hard to trace, um, but also that the kind of um, aesthetic experiments that are taking place in solitary confinement are different largely because of the isolation and the, ex the extreme restrictions that take place um, in that space. And one of the artists I feature in the book is Ajuri Lutala, who was a member of the Black Liberation Army. He now works um, with American Friends Service Committee, their prison watch program, and he spent 22 years in solitary confinement um, for his political beliefs. And during that time, he created a series of really powerful collages that documented his experience in solitary confinement, but also commented on, uh, critiqued um, the, 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 the system of, of long-term incarceration and punitive isolation. And then I closed the book um, by thinking about um, an, a contemporary artist, uh, Sable Ely Smith, who has never been sentenced to prison, but she spent many years going back and forth to prison um, because her father was sentenced to life when she was 10. And her artwork reflects um, this kind of fragmentation of Black family life. Um, it thinks about the kind of um, the traumatic experience of, of carcerality, even when you're not sentenced to prisons and the ways that prison and carcerality self-regulate -reg the body, especially bodies of, of Black people. Um, and she's also thinking about larger communities that are impacted by carcerality. So I end with Sable as a way of thinking about um, the kind of this, these aesthetic experiments um, as happening across sites of, of the carcel archipelago. So I'm going to stop sharing images right now. See if we can return. Is that good? Ruha, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Okay, great. All right, can you hear me good? I can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay, are you all? Okay, perfect. So, so I'm just gonna share just a few, just a few reflections for a couple minutes, and then um, then we can talk. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> so Nicole, I'm just so honored, so honored to be in conversation with you tonight about this incredible text. Among the many poignant passages that really made me have to catch my breath is the closing line of the intro um, where you write, there are lessons here developed by the punished and the imprisoned about how to create, to forge relations and to embody and represent one's life under unimaginable conditions. 
From these lessons, we learn about a society that relies on punitive confinement as a solution to myriad social, economic, political, ecological, and health crises. Prisons, indefinite detention, parole, concentration camps exist in as much as we allow them. In particular, this phrase, forge relations, um, it sticks with me because one of the recurring themes that runs across this entire book is this idea of relationality, how the carceral system works mightily, often successfully, to sever social relations between those who are incarcerated and their families, communities, and the larger body politic. And at the same time, you demonstrate how carceral aesthetics works in the other direction to forge different kinds of relationality between the incarcerated artists and their family members with activists, the art world, and artists with themselves in a process of creative self-fashioning. The artists you introduce us to in many ways are refusing to be forgotten and also refusing to forget themselves. So one of the things that Marking Time brought up for me is how the deliberate severing of relationships and sociality with those who are incarcerated is part of a broader attack on the very idea of the social. The basic mm -hmm. notion that not only should human beings coexist, but that each person should have what they need to exist in the first place. And that there's even something, even something that we might call a we worth working for. We live in a world in which none of this is a given. As I was reading, I flashed back to this moment, which may seem very, very unrelated, but I had just been watching The Great Hack, which is a documentary on Netflix, which all of you should watch, by the way. And this moment when the narrator explains the intention of those waging a campaign to manipulate the electorate through social media on both sides of the Atlantic during the 2016 election and Brexit vote. And the narrator states the, their goal is to break society. Quote, it is only when you break it, they insist, that you can remodel the pieces into your vision of a new society. So their new vision, of course, is nothing new. It's just more white supremacy, more class warfare, more patriarchy, more imperialism. And to get more, they need to break us mm -hmm. by deepening social divisions and amplifying social hierarchies using what might be better called anti-social media. The point being there are powerful people and organizations working overtime to undermine the very notion of society mm -hmm. and that the carceral apparatus is a powerful part of that machinery. Breaking people in prison is part of a broader attempt to break society. In the very conceptions of individual innocence and guilt that you're writing against throughout this book, we can witness how the policies and structures that govern our lives work against the so working against the social, promoting a corrosive individualism cloaked in the language of freedom. This was true before the pandemic and has intensified since. So this touted freedom of those demanding to open America back up is really about the freedom to go to work without sick leave, the freedom to nurse the ailing without protective equipment, the freedom to grow the nation's food with the looming threat of ice raids, the freedom to be stranded in nursing homes with no way to avoid contagion, the freedom to be warehoused in prisons with no way to socially distance, the freedom to let the most vulnerable die off. The aim of this strain of freedom, a freedom from mutual obligation, is to break society, to erode mutuality, to grind down our ability to care for one another, to eat away at any notion of a commons or a collective good, and to destroy the institutions that would allow us to practice social solidarity. So this brings me back to marking time, which shows us the violent underbelly, the underbelly of this dominant ideology of freedom, that cruel conception of individualism in the artist's works of those, you know, the work of those who are incarcerated. And you remind us, in your words, prison 
thrives on limiting the field of vision of imprisoned people and the non-incarcerated public, though in very different ways. And, and for me, this book, page after page, um, expands our field of vision in a really profound way. And for that, I want to thank you for the years and years of labor and reflection and research and relationships that form this, this really beautiful text. So with those initial reflections, Nicole, I'd love for you just to give us a, a, even more of a glimpse into your process of researching the book as it draws on so many different kinds of relationships with the formerly and currently incarcerated people, family members, and many more. So could you just give us a little bit more behind the scenes, the process of, um, of creating this text? You know, Ruha, thank you for those beautiful comments. Thank you so much, they, very meaningful. And as you were talking about freedom um, or the cruelty of this, uh, that vision of freedom, um, I, I just, I, in my mind, I kept saying, you know, only, we can only embrace that if we embrace the delusion that we're entitled to a certain freedom and other people are entitled to be in, in help in punitive captivity and literally death machines right now. Like, and for us to actually like, just buy that logic. Like that's the only way we can accept that idea of freedom is, is if we also accept the logic of a death machine that 2 million plus people are in. And those are only the numbers we're counting because that 2.3 doesn't account for people held in indefinite detention or in you know these black or gray sites or who are held in county jails and then released weeks or months later or never released, right? So there's all these bodies, all these people, all these lives, all these families that are deeply impacted and who's who and we can't account for those numbers, right? So it's a it's a it's a um it's a necropolitical idea of freedom, right? And it's it's a it's savage. It's a really savage idea of freedom that then creates hostility between you know we can. I I I live in New York City and I'm feeling the rising hostility that people are feeling just around quarantining. You know, right? And so and it's the failure of leadership. It's the failure. You know, it's also the uh, a failure of an idea that uh, we can all be cared for. Right, that where that and that society is about a kind of notion of a collective care, and this actually this gets to practice. And for me, I I had to write a note on method, like how. And you're a sociologist, so you're like I'm I'm a I'm an interdisciplinary scholar. We don't often write notes on methods, but it was so important for me to have a note on method and to say that this is me witnessing the women in my family care for incarcerated people, care for people who are not in prison, care for communities. And it's and what they did were what they saw other women do and what other women did. And what and this to me is very much connected to what you're talking about with abolitionist tools that often we think it's something it has to be something new and high tech. And I mean people we've been practicing this collectively and often quietly. Right. And it's the only reason we're still here right now, because for 500 years, people have done everything they want to you know, extract labor from us and then to say we're disposable, but essential. Right. So the only way that we're we've, we're still here is because of these incredible practices, of collective care. Um, and I so as I, you know, over the years of visiting incarcerated relatives, I just you know, I would see like, especially my aunt Sharon, like just like the way that, I mean, I think there is a question that I'm, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Like you and I just gone back and forth about like maybe what's not included. And I realized I was like, I don't think I wrote about this moment where when we were at court and Alan was being sentenced and the judge said 15 to life or 18 to life. And I had just graduated from college. And I would just start it cool, like I lost it. But all the family who had been in my hometown, they had already met, met and made an agreement that no matter what the sentence, they were gonna smile wow. to let Alan know that he's alive and he's loved. And so I'm the only one crying. And my aunt turned to me and she said, stop crying. You're not going to prison with Alan. Hmm. We have to be strong. Like she literally turned to, to me and said that and to me, and it wasn't a strong, like, I don't have emotions. We waited until after we left, right? Yeah. To like, But just that they had come together and had a real sense of like how they were going to get through, no matter what yeah. 
the state said they weren't going to let that sever their relationships with loved ones. So that like my note on method is like what I learned just living and watching the women around me. Right. And, and, I, and I, what I really love about that is that your note on method at the heart of it is this ethic of care, both for the people and the subject. And I think that that is something that no matter the discipline, I think that that needs to be more explicit in all of our methodological sort of visions is why and what do you care about this rather than trying to pretend like we have this kind of social distance from our own subjects of inquiry. And so I think that your approach to it has something to teach those in my own discipline and in general about how we braid together the personal stakes for ourselves in this work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's seeing also the care, because I think often we who are abolitionists or right, scholars or prisons, we can be guilty of writing about incarcerated people in ways that does not deal, address the complexity of agency, like just like complex choices that people are making, even within material and spatial constraints, you know, and so I had the opportunity to witness the kind of collective care of people who are in prison and who people are not, who are formerly incarcerated. And so the only reason I have this like rich, the riches of amazing artists in the book is because our other artists who were either in prison or have been in prison, like you have to contact this person. Are you have so they were like it was the opposite of like the kind of capitalist art market of like, there's only one great that it was there like, no, you have to reach out and you wow. have to get in touch with this artist and you, you know, and putting me in touch with your parents or, you know, so like really it was, it was a type of generosity. I love um, and that generosity can also only, I think, emerge when you let go of a, a sense of kind of like, so Ruth, Ruth, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore talks about the site of the convict race and she borrows that from um, a prison um, activist uh, in Lucasville in the 70s or 80s. I, I can't re remember the entire context, but it was that um, incarcerated people, when they resist the very thing that the prison state tries to do, which is create these like factions and division and as a way of managing the population. But when they resist that and they actually kind of claim a status as a convict race, that's like multiracial, multigender, that the, like the power of that, right? And so many of the artists that I talked to, even if they, they weren't using that category, they were still coming up to, they were creating a sense of belonging. And it was a sense of belonging that came from the state rendering them failures, social failures, right? And that, and also the kind of radical experimentation of was also their their aesthetic like horizons were all about like I've been I've been deemed a failure. I can do it, you know. Therefore, I can play around with whatever, right? You know. And so that was also there were all, you know amazing lessons in that also. Absolutely, and one of the many many places where I really appreciated. Um, your voice and proximity was in chapter seven. You showed us the one picture of um, your family. Mm -hmm. And so this chapter posing in prison, when you, there was another photograph you were describing with you, your mom, your aunt, and your cousin, Alan, who, who was incarcerated at the time. And you write, I want to alter the image to paint his face over with a cold stare, a mischievous grin, something other than the look of resignation of being caught up in a narrative that is bigger than the self. So now that we've heard just a little bit more about your research process, can you say something more about the writing process and your practice, your, your decisions when and how to include personal narrative? And then also if you have anything more to say about the other things perhaps that you decided not to include, certain stories or experiences of your own and those of artists, because I think also the decision, the refusal to include certain things, I think is part of the ethic and the relationship in, in the text. Yeah. Um, you know, I was so I was so haunted by that image. And it was during a visit where and Alan didn't, you know, and I think it was not long after he had gotten denied a, a parole, right? And so it's just, you know, and I was initially just interested or motivated to think about like, how are we staying connected? Like really thinking that through and like his mom and his sister Cassandra were the root of that. They would every 
Saturday without fail, no matter where he was, no matter what was happening in their lives, they would get up and they would spend that spend Saturday with him. And I'm talking about we can't even calculate all the money. But I remember before they even had these like digital machines in prison, his the first thought we would make was at the laundromat and his mom would take 20s and convert them to quarters because all you could bring in. So she was bringing in like bags of quarters to like buy stuff from vending machines and photos and like just, you know, and the three hour drive to wherever. Right. So just like she's one of many millions of people doing that to sustain these relationships. Um, and so I was, I wanted to get at the motive. I wanted to like, think about like, how are we tr trying to trace emotions and how these images were circulating and like how Alan would always ask for photographs. You know, it, it started off with us just to me, I mean, with just like how there was just always this request about for images. And he was always really generous about sending images of himself that he had to pay $2 and 50 cents for, although he's only making a few cents an hour in prison. Right. Like, so, um, that really is what kind of started me. And then like all these emotions just, you know, that that essay, this chapter was initially an essay that took me three years to write because it was just like so emotionally difficult to like process it. And um, so I think in that, you know, I, you know, things were coming up um, like I I'm you asked about one thing that I d didn't write about. I only talk about cases if people want me to talk about cases. Like that's one of the things. And for some of the artists, it's really, their case is very important to them. And having it narrated a certain way was very important. Like Lizette, Lizette Oblitas, she's in the book. And Lizette was involved in a fatal car accident. And it was, and I sent her my description and we revised it several times because it was, there was a precision for her and how that that needed to be told. Mm. Um, so that's what I mean partly also by it being a collective. As much as possible, people read what I wrote about them okay. in advance. So there's a chapter about um, collaborations with nonprofits and, and, and there's also a critique of those organizations in there. Yeah. And I had several people who work for those organizations read it and they were like, that they learned a lot or they if they felt like I was being harsh about certain things, you know, we kind of had a back and forth. And, and it wasn't that I was like, um, I wasn't in any way censoring myself, but I really wanted the, com the complexity of people's work and labor and investments to be reflected, even whether I agree or not. But I wanted, I, I didn't want to use anyone as like uh, a straw person. I didn't want to flatten anyone's experience. And so, and I think that, meant that it took me a long time to write and rewrite and rewrite. And I'm not saying that it, it is by any means perfect, yeah. but there was a lot of back and forth with the people who appear, you know, most of them are living. There are some people who are like Billy sales, someone I write about who didn't survive solitary confinement, you know, and that telling his story was very hard. And, and I was only able to do that because I was able to connect with Tracy Ziegler, who was his um, teacher. Um, art teacher. Um, so for me, it was like really this kind of back and forth and it was, and it was relational. Like, so one of the things I learned from the artist is just like the importance of relationality. And so then I tried to use that as a model in the book itself, yeah. right? That this was not about, I, I didn't want it to feel transactional. And I think many of the artists would say that too, that like, you know, it was just a lot, it, it was a lot of, and even when I was finishing the book, and copywriting it, I was like copy editing, going through copy edits. I was like, you know how that can be. I was like having emotional breakdowns and <laughs> three of the artists were reaching out to me like, you can get through this. You can get through this. Cheering you on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they're yeah. like, you have to do it for all of us, you know. Yes. Like, pushing me like literally over the yeah. So I'll ask one more question and then we have such great questions coming in. So I'll spend the, um, the last uh, few minutes sharing some of those. But the last question really returns us to this idea of relationality. I was thinking about, you know, the most extreme method of severing that sociality or relationality is solitary confinement, which I think makes your chapter um, titled Resisting Isolation, one of the hardest to read and process, and I bet write as well. So you introduce us in this chapter to 
four artistic projects that reveal different aspects about art in solitary confinement. And then you ask us to consider how the restrictions on mobility, the sensory control, and the lack of human contact impact the aesthetic experiences and practices of people in solitary. So for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet, can you just say a little bit more about this particular form of carceral aesthetics and perhaps, um, yeah, your own relationship to this part? So if, and I think if, if, if there's not a greater teaching moment for like the national non-incarcerated public broadly is like, to think about how we're using words like quarantining yeah. and isolation and because it's nothing compared to what it, it, it means or the experience of 23 hours or sometimes 24 hours in a six foot by nine foot box. Like the depth of devastation um, is, I, it took me that that was the last chapter I I wrote, but it was literally a compilation of things that I had already written across other chapters. I, I realized though that it, the experience was so broad that across all the artists, I'd say two thirds of them had talked about some stint in solitary confinement. Mm. So I said, I so I, then I was like, let me put this together and see what's what's coming out of this, you know, and. Um, it is, I mean, it's, it's an ethical, it's an ethical, it's the ethical um, paradox or crisis. It's not a, a paradox, it's a crisis, right? That we actually allow some, you know, maybe 75,000 people. We don't really know how many people are in solitary confinement right. to live in conditions that we know are torture. We've known that the, the state, the, the federal state, federal government has known that since solitary confinement was created, like in the first penitentiaries, it was a disaster. People went mad or people committed suicide and nothing about the conditions have changed. People, it still drives, it literally is a way of eviscerating all relationality of turning people sometimes against themselves, mm -hmm. right? Like forcing a relationship, forcing such a violent relationship with the self and the state is just fully mandating that, right? So um, that that chapter is, is hard to read, I think, uh, but it's I think it's a really important chapter for people to think about just like, you know, this is not about beautifying mural projects happening in mess halls and prisons in California. That this that like the stakes are life and death, and it and, I, and the chapter starts with someone who dies in solitary confinement. You know, not too long after creating this self portrait that is very haunting. Yeah. Um. And um. You know. And I, but I think it is a moment for us not just to think about the language we're using to talk about what we're going through right now, but the fact that like, um. Just the conditions of prison, right? So it's like. People, one of the things about people self-reporting sickness is that they're put in solitary confinement. And some people are so afraid of being put in solitary confinement that they don't report sickness, that they're sick because they're gonna get punished for being sick in prison. But we also know that there's no way of social, as, as like uh, my friend Jesse Crime says, you can't social, socially distance when you're in a cage, period, right? Um, but we're so fixated on thinking that people are in prisons because they've done something wrong that we don't like, you know, that we're, we, we stay there. Yeah. Yeah. We stay that like, oh, they belong to be in, in this place because they've done something wrong. And that to me, that is the crisis for me of the moment, yeah. you know, and that is like, and we know that the number of deaths are higher in prison, the number of exposure and also deaths are higher. And James Hoff, who, who's now out of prison said, we have to memorialize the people who've already died in prison because even, you know, we know that there are under reportings in New York, but talk about under reportings of death and names that we'll never know, people who've died. Think about the people who are in solitary confinement or, or in any kind of carceral facility. And I know I'm right. I can't stop talking because yeah, that's okay. So I'll ask you. I'll ask you um, 
Uh, first, the first couple of questions are, you know, almost um, about now the circulation of the book and of the art. So I'll ask them together. So Lucy asks, given that many books have been viewed by the prison system as contraband and potential catalysts for prison protests, as well as the content of your book, what was the process of getting the book into prisons? Did you or the publisher have to market this book to prisons in a particular way? And was that a tricky process on the one hand? And then Ted asks, what happens to art made in prison? Does it get displayed somehow within the prison or is it just private activity? And are there costs associated with making art? Do prisoners have to purchase their own supplies and how expensive are they? Those are, thank you for, for those questions. And so you asked a question about what I didn't share. And so like there's certain things I don't share about how people get art out. Yes, yes. Because they, you know, it's kid, kid other people in art. So there's the, there are these, you know, it's like an underground road. I mean, there is literally a yes. way of like getting things out that- Exactly. And as Frederick Douglass said, you know, these abolitionists are over here making the underground railroad, the <laughs> overground railroad. So you in withholding information, I think is part of that ethic um, right. of, you know, of care that you've brought to this entire work. So we and can appreciate people that. people in the book did things for other people in the book that I did not say. Yes. Like they helped facilitate things. Good, yeah that made the book come together, but I didn't reveal. So how did you get the book into prisons? So um, we were able to get this under this for me. And, and my Harvard was not resisting this at all. But I just said, like, I, I'm not OK with this book re being released to like a non incarcerated public. And Harvard does heart back first. Right. And not going going into prison. So we were able to ask Art for Justice Fund to if they would underwrite it. And they were very gracious and generous about doing that. So that was one way is that we were able to get support to do a special version. And that like it, that version was ready before the other one was. And so th for me, that was amazing. And then to work with organizations that already have relationships I, with either in, with incarcerated collectivities, with sometimes prison staff that are sympathetic to programs, and so that it's like, without going into too much oversharing, mm -hmm. how do you make something seem non-threatening mm -hmm. to get it in? Yes. So just figuring, but not using language to water down the project at all, but working with trusted networks and alliances. And, and some people, and I think it's also this weird COVID moment because I, there's a, there's Kenneth Reams who's in probably the most restrictive unit of the people who are still in prison in a book. He's in, he's on, on death row in Arkansas. Hmm. And he told his story during the book launch is for what's called felony murder, where he didn't pull a trigger, but he was with someone who did. And he got a death sentence at age 18, the youngest, person in the state of Arkansas, and he's been in solitary confinement there for 27 years. He got a copy of that book before anyone. So, and I think it's partly this COVID mom, I, you know, the generosity of spirit is moving certain things and I'm, I'm, I don't know, you know, I'm just, yes, I can't say the logic of why some places and then ones, some places not, but just sending as much as we can and having people write me and say, or having relatives email me saying they got the book. Yes. So, and I know in several states people have because they've written me to, to let me know that. And so there's a question here that builds on the part of our conversation about, um, you know, your own stakes in the project, the real emotional and personal stakes with balancing that with traditional scholarly methodologies. And so Elaine asks, what advice do you have for scholars about the messiness of this type of work? Mm -hmm. She's coming from the point of view of someone who's a historian of science with personal stakes in her own project. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think work is messy, right? Like I, I at some point I just had to re uh, resist the idea of like getting it right and just think, okay, well, like these for me is this is practices of care and recognition. Like just I want I just wanted people to be able to see themselves as complex and loved human beings. And I realized when I was finishing, it's like anyone I, who appear in this book, I'm going to practice love towards. As you know, like I'm you know that for me, and that doesn't sound very academic, but it was really important for me that it was really this was like a very it was a love pro project of like how to create 
the beloved community that I want to be a participant in and I want other people to be able to be mobile and like envision together. So it was like, how do, how am I trying to be an agent in the world that I want to live in? Yes. Like, and really just trying to figure that out. Like how, um, how can I, and that means that I allow myself to make mistakes. Like I made a huge mistake with uh, Ojuri Lutala who was telling me about when he was in a, this blood state, he was being tortured and he was locked into a cell covered in blood. He told me that three times over a year and a half and it, and it wasn't until I was transcribing his interviews that I realized he was, he kept just restating his trauma and I wasn't hearing it on, you know, it's like, I wasn't, it wasn't until I was transcribing and I was like, oh my God, the way he was stating it over and over again. So like I was making mistakes, right? And which is sometimes when we are politically or emotionally invested, then we can paralyze ourselves thinking that we have to be right or we have to always be on the right side of this. And, yeah. and life is just complex, you know? And so we have to like, so for me, it was like, a lot of times I was making mistakes. It was very messy. I lost interview, you know, I was making mistakes. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, I and I think that's part of it is just like being, fully human in the project too, right? Like not thinking that, I, I was trying to be as um, available to the project as I could allow myself to be. Yes. And so um, we have a few, couple more minutes. I have some questions here that are more about kind of um, next steps. And so if anyone wants to add any questions or upvote anything, feel free in the next minute. But we have a question here. Um, I think Spencer, we kind of got to your question when we were talking about solitary confinement, David, asks, um, actually, Denise asks about the MoMA exhibition. Is it going to be rescheduled? Will there be a virtual museum show? So I want to make it clear that it's PS1. And okay. MoMA and PS1, are, you know, like it says MoMA PS1, but it's at PS1. And uh, and yes, it's going to be rescheduled. And PS1 has been incredibly, MoMA PS1 has been incredibly supportive. And we're all just have to, you know, we all have to wait until cultural institute. It's safe for cultural institutions to reopen, and then to see how that's going to get reconfigured in terms of how we are able to gather. And but it will be physically installed at some point. I don't know when, but I'm I'm eager to announce when as soon as I find out. Um, I did not address the question of like art supplies, and it's so again. To, to, like practices of collective care, a lot of materials are shared among incarcerated people. So like they resource pool, they peer mentor. If you have a technique that you can teach someone, so people are constantly teaching each other, like how to use various supplies. Um, some, every facility is different. In some prisons, people can order supplies. Uh, in institutions that have um, relationships with nonprofits that bring arts to, you know, like art workshops, then often, people will use those supplies for their own individual practice as well. But then there are pla places like death row in Louisiana where you're forbidden to make art. Like there's actually a like criminal sentence if you're caught making art because some art was released from death row and made money. And so the, the, the answer, the carceral logic is then people on and who are sentenced to death are not allowed to make art, hmm. right? So there's a whole range um, and it really depends on, sometimes it also depends on just your level, your security level in a facility. Like, so there's a range of, you know, or how long you're into your sentences, like your sentence. Some prisons, if you're, you can only do certain programs if you're like X years away from being released, which makes it harder for people with life sentences or people who are in uh, um, maximum security prisons, they often have fewer programs, for example. And, you know, and they're the ones who are spending their entire, often their entire adult lives um, in captivity. Thank you for that. Um, Maya asks, can you suggest artists or marketplaces that have work by directly impacted artists for sale? So I'm, I'm not in the business of selling work um but there you know um i would say there's a great coalition run by wendy jason called justice arts coalition and they're online and it's a collection it's a large national coalition of art teachers um formerly incarcerated artists organizations that are supporting the arts in prisons um and i'm not sure if through that you might find places where that are ethically selling you know uh, work, but I would just say check out Justice Arts Coalition because it is a great uh, resource for people who are interested more broadly in the topic. And it's practitioners. They're all practitioners who are 
who are part of that coalition. Thank you. And then the last question we'll end with is from Amy. And she asked, did you encounter challenges in mounting the related exhibition of artworks by incarcerated artists? Um, and how did the exhibition project challenge the exhibiting institution in generative ways? And maybe if you can broaden that to thinking about how the art world in general um, is having to adapt or change in light of um, this work. Right. So with PS1, we were working with this a thought collective and it uh, includes people who are directly impacted, activists, teachers. So we had a, just a really wonderful range of diverse voices. And so a lot of the um, kind of like questions around programming and, and curatorial practice, we would collect, you know, talk together collectively about. And, and, um, and I've all, you know, I've remained so much of like my book and, and any ex exhibition work I've done has been like having conversations with people who have been a part of the process for many years, like Jesse Crimes, um, Russell Craig, Jared Owens, Gilberto, Mary, Ty Mary Baxter, Tyra Patterson. There's been people have looked like, We've just now, I feel like we can have these conversations and just, it's not like yes or no, black or white, you know, it's just like not the nuances of it. Um, PS1 has been great about just like really, a really expansive and radical vision of what a show can be in, um, you know, in a contemporary art space. I, for many years, when I started working on this project, you know, I, I'm very thankful to the Whiting Foundation, ACLS, um, the Coleman Center, the Bellagio Foundation. There were lots of places, people, especially the last half of the project that funded me. The first four years, I couldn't, like, people are like, what are you talking about, prison art? We, I, I mean, like, I really, like, it was like a series of no's mm. before I got to yeses. Mm. And so, I, and for me, part of it was just like, if you believe in your work, you just keep doing Because it. it was like lots and lots and lots of no's. And even... A uh, PS1 took a uh, huge risk with e agreeing for the show to do the show, um, and I, 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 uh, some other you know major institutions in New York City were not interested. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I don't want to go into you know disparaging, but I'm just saying like yeah. even that they saw the vision and they really embraced it, and they were like, "This is really you know." So I'm, it was great, you know. Yeah, and so that that is a lesson in of itself that you put in the time to make marking time. And so I just wanna encourage everyone, you guys can see mine is already marked up <laughs> with the stickies, encourage you to get it as soon as possible. Nicole, thank you so much for this labor of love. Um, it, it's really an honor to be in conversation with you and thank you so much for your work and thank you Labyrinth for hosting this conversation. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I'm going to add my my uh, two words of thanks to both of you for this really incredibly rich conversation and Nicole, uh, you for this remarkable book. I feel like this hour has given um, people a real sense of the many, many dimensions and the many voices also of your own and the voices of, of your, the, the subjects in the book. Um, so thank you for that. Um, uh, quickly, I wanted to make sure people know, so there are almost 300 people who registered for this event and um, not all of them could be on, on this uh, call right now, but it is recorded and uh, we're going to send around a, a link. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. Um, I'll make sure that the people who were registered all get a link and then um, so it can, there are other chances to, to listen in on, on this conversation. Um, one other thing, the three of us talked yesterday a little bit about groups that are doing important work on behalf of the incarcerated and um, Nicole and Ruha both gave thought to which groups are, are doing especially uh, important work and if you see the the sort of call to action button on the bottom of your screen. We're just highlighting right now the uh, national bailout um, uh, organization. But this goes under the rubric of what you both talked about so 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 forcefully, the practices of collective care. This is just a moment where uh, so much of that is needed by so many. Um, the other groups that we didn't have space for, um, but that you also mentioned, whose work you mentioned, we will put in the chat here, um, and we will also send out on the Labyrinth social media, on our Instagram and our Facebook, uh, links to those. So. Um, 
those of you who want to um, keep thinking and, and do something concrete on behalf of the incarcerated uh, can take a look there. The last thing is uh, just to, another thank you to the library. I want to be sure you guys know that you can follow us um, for other events like this, either by um, just following the particular this live stream uh, Crowdcast platform, or you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Um, there's also a sign up on both the library's website for their newsletter and on our website for our, our newsletter. You'd get one newsletter each week with upcoming events. Um, and so stay in the loop. We'd love to see you again at other on other occasions. But for now, thank you to both of you um, for your eloquence and your passion. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm happy to sign books too. So, it, yeah, <laughs> so those, 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 right. So those um, the signing plates will come to Labyrinth, and then you can get a book and get a get a signed copy that way. Um, have a peaceful evening. Stay well. Take care, everybody. Thank uh, you. Take really care. It's Bye nice to see you. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye everyone. Have a good evening.